Hello, everyone, and welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Jacqueline Sundberg, and I work with the Rohr Collections here at the McGill Library. That stands for Rare Books and Special Collections, the Ozer Library, the Visual Arts Collection, and Archives and Records Management. And today, um, well, we're well into February at this point, but we are celebrating Black History Month this month. And we take the time to celebrate, consider, and discuss Black history in Canada and beyond. And we're happy today to have Professor Ajayti with us to explore early 20th century history and a critical moment in racial awakening and Black self-determination. So next slide, another very important one, is the fact that McGill University is located on land that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe nations. Roar and McGill honors, recognizes, and respects these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we meet today. And this community that meets and exchanges ideas, we're all tuning in from diverse places due to COVID-19, but the virtual format does let us come together and continue to connect over ideas like today's topic. So I'm now going to introduce uh, Natalie Cook, who's the Associate Dean of War, and she's going to give some opening comments and get the program rolling. After her introduction, we're going to hear from Christopher Lyons for a short intro to some Roar holdings and then the main event with Professor Ajit. So Natalie, over to you. Thanks so much, Jacqueline. You know, it's a genuine pleasure to host and to welcome my colleague, Professor Ni Lee Ajte, for today's presentation. 1919, the year of the Black Revolutionary Messiah. You know, each Roar event gives us a chance to learn something new and also to review our relate, related collections as we prepare to host these events. And I confess today has an additional benefit that it's a chance for me to meet a new colleague because I haven't actually met um, Professor Ajte in person, even though he's been on campus for um, more than two years at this point, um, and we've been working remotely. But as we gradually come back to campus, and by the way, we think we are going to have, be able to host events again in person as of about mid-March. Um, I'm looking forward to bumping him into him on campus in person in three dimensions. Um, a few thank yous. First to all of you for joining us this lunch hour to hear about anti-Black violence and resistance in 1919, and for taking the time to spend lunch hour with us at Roar. Um, but I also want to thank our sponsors, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and a couple of very generous private donors, Ron Harvey and Doug Bagley. And it was their contributions that actually allowed us to apply to Shirk in the first place and to leverage their donations into additional tri-council funding. Um, in fact, it's through both fin gifts, financial and of special collections that ROAR is what it is today, a rich resource for students, researchers, teachers. And as you look around the virtual room for those who follow their curiosity from question to question and discovery to discovery. You know, the library is in the planning stages of bu a building project to redesign and reimagine the McLennan Library. With the support of committed donors, this building project, which we call Fiat Lux, Let There Be Light, will reimagine our physical spaces to meet the needs of the 21st century students and also of timeless collections. Um, as we move into the digital age, it's these physical primary collections that actually distinguish one library from another. So ironically, as digital surrogates become more important, so we're starting to value more and more the, the original primary materials. And on that note, let me hand it over to our head of rare and special collections, Chris Lyons, um, to tell us more about the collections and also to introduce today's speaker. Well, Thank you very much, Natalie, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on where you're from. I'm delighted to be here, as always, and I'm excited to introduce you to some of the material that we have in our collections, which are relevant to those of us who are interested in Black history in general and Canadian history in particular. And I'm just going to show you a few things very quickly. Keep in mind as you're seeing this and hearing about this, this is 
couple of things. One, it's only the tip of the iceberg of things that we have that are relevant to this collection and this topic, but then also that this material is accessible to everyone. We're a public institution and we really enjoy sharing this with you. So you don't need to be a McGill affiliate to access it. We're open to the public. And as you hear, as things are reopening, it's possible to make appointments to consult any of this material. Our email address is on our website. So you're always welcome to get in touch with us and pursue things. So on that proviso, so what you're looking at is just, as I said, a way of giving you some idea of what we have in particular. And I'd like to start, and I'm gonna focus a little bit in a couple of minutes I have on this man in particular. His name is Roy States, and he was a autodidact who was fascinated by um, Afro-Canadian history and um, Black history in general. And he worked at McGill uh, up until his death in 1980. And like many people in underrepresented communities, he became a historian and librarian and archivist uh, because no one else was really doing that work. And we were just very fortunate is that when he passed, his widow donated his collection to Rare Books and Special Collections, which we have now. Give you a sense of what it is. There are two major elements to it. One of it is books, and the other is ephemera, gray literature, and things like that. The books, as you can see in this uh, classification, usually deal with history, biography, and areas like that. Not so much literature. So Roy was definitely interested in history and contemporary political issues as opposed to um, authors and poets. Uh, as you can see, a lot of the material dates from the era when Roy would have been uh, collecting actively and probably had the money to do so. So most of the material comes from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, as you can see here. And to give you a flavor of what it is, I've just taken some pictures of the uh, book uh, shelves. So uh, biblioporn, as some people call this. Anyway, so as you can see, contemporary issues related to um, Africa, this whole era of... Uh, decolonization, independence, and early independent movements and uh, establishment of countries, uh, historical material related, written in the 60s, 70s. Roots was the most popular uh, television special, was based on Alex Haley's novel, and I remember watching it in the 70s and uh, being introduced to Kunta Kinte and, and um, other fascinating people. And But the really powerful stuff, which I want to underscore to you, is this more ephemeral periodical literature and related things which are very hard to find and it's there's both Canadian and non-Canadian content but it's a Canadian content I find it's particularly rare and valuable if you're interested particularly in a very important period in Afro-Canadian history the 60s and 70s 60s and 70s because of big changes in um, not only legislature but also immigration and then the makeup of the Afro-Canadian community uh, so here's an example of something I found particularly intriguing, Angolan arms, so something from the early 1970s related to the anti-Portuguese uh, colonial uh, struggle for uh, independence, published by a group in Richmond, British Columbia. So that, to me, that's the sort of thing that just raises fascinating questions. A lot of community newspapers, such as the Montreal Oracle, which um, these aren't full runs, but they're often, you know, several I issues that... Um, Roy probably picked up as they were being published. Uh, Contrast being another one, uh, and even Halifax newspaper, which I hadn't heard of before. And you can see that was actually even something he subscribed to. He was from Nova Scotia, as uh, many uh, Black Canadians were. And you have more um, underground material. This is a, a 70s mimeographed uh, work from the Black River Liberation Action Committee of Montreal. Uh, the Black Action Party, again, another mimeographed work, a lot of really interesting information in these about things that you won't necessarily find anywhere else. Uh, another, another group related to the study, um, and then different things put out by the community, very interesting things. I was like, how to, how to relate to the, the school boards in, in Montreal if you're from the, the Caribbean, that sort of thing. And it's, again, a fascinating insight of, of how people adapted to survive and to understand and be understood in a new and not always very accommodating uh, society. Uh, Non-American, non-Canadian material, things like this, like the Black Panther uh, 
periodical, uh, other very, uh, let's say, niche uh, organizational publications as well. So great, great, great stuff there. Uh, a couple of other complementary collections. Uh, we have, interestingly enough, uh, Nathanson collection of Lincoln material, which was donated to us from Dr. Nathan uh, in the 60s and 70s. A uh, lot of interesting things, but for the purposes of today's uh, subject, there's a lot of material, of course, related to the issues of slavery in the United States and Civil War. There are a lot of books, so a lot of uh, slave narratives and things like that, but then also um, lithographic material like this as well. The third collection I want to mention is a very interesting one. It's an 18 volume collection of pamphlets. So, so these pamphlets were collected uh, in the 19th century. And as you can see, one of the affiliated colleges to McGill, uh, Congregational College, which I believe is now the United Church, part of the United Church in, in the hints, so the predecessor of the United Theological College, had a collection mostly of things related to emancipation and the emanci emancipation and anti-slavery movement by British and American religious organizations. So that gives you some flavor of the sorts of things we have, but there's a lot more as well. There are other collections, like if you're interested in the, the racial or pseudo-scientific ideas of race, the Ulster Library of the History of Medicine has amazing material related to that from the 19th century, the 18th century, and the 20th century as well. There's also non-paper uh, based material around that we've been doing, including podcasts. And one of them is quite interesting. It's with the first black woman to ever be named Carnival Queen, I think anywhere in North America, the Quebec, uh, the Winter Carnival here at McGill in 1949, and a couple of other people, uh, women subsequently, um, who were named Carnival Queen. So that's in our series of podcasts uh, that are on our website. And we also have a, a digital game um, and we have three editions of this in the last edition called Quiz That So includes archival material of a number of uh, Black and other BIPOC uh, people who contributed to McGill's history. So that gives you some flavor of what we have. And like I said, we're out open to please contact me for anything. But enough about me. You didn't come here to hear me drone on about the collections, which in my great enthusiasm, I can go on to forever, but we have better things awaiting. And that is a colleague and I'd like to say emerging friend, because he's a, a, an exceptional individual, Professor Wendell Nilele Ajite, who is a history professor here at McGill with his area of research being the post-Reconstruction United States and the African-American experience. His research broadly is excavating freedom linkages among the United States, Canada, and other pa parts of the African diaspora. Before arriving at McGill, he held the William Lyon Mackenzie King Fellowship at Harvard University's Weatherhead Center for International Affairs and the Department of, in the Department of History Lectureship. He's won a number of prizes, not surprisingly, and as you'll hear when you, you have a chance to hear him speak, as soon as I stop speaking, um, and recent publications, one of them is in the Canadian Historical Review, um, volume 102, number one, which came out last year. It's entitled In Search of Ethiopia, Messianic Pan-Africanism and the Problem of the Promised Land, 1919, 1931, and two upcoming works, which um, I find particularly exciting them. One is a chapter in a book entitled Unsettling the Great White North, coming out next month by the University of Toronto Press. And his article there is Petitioning Power, Canadian Racial Consciousness Meets Alabama Injustice, 1958. I'm dying, I have no idea what this refers to. So I'm really keen to be hearing about what that is. He also has a monograph coming out, congratulations. Um, Cross-Border Cosmopolitans, The Making of a Pan-African North America, 1900 to 2000. And that's coming out, I believe this fall in the University of North Carolina Press. So. On that note, I turn the mic over to the main event of today. Thank you. My pleasure, my pleasure. Uh, for those whose cameras are enabled, if you can give me a thumbs up to indicate that you can hear me. Okay, clearly, all right, wonderful. Okay, let me just adjust my volume setting here. So good day, everyone. My name is Wendell Nilai Ajite. I appreciate our rare special collections unit for inviting me to deliver this talk. Um, thank you all as well for 
attending and participating on this overcast, somewhat snowy afternoon. And for those who are in a space where you can enable your cameras, I'm especially uh, appreciative and uh, grateful for that. I often tell my students when I have to lecture on Zoom that it's, uh, it helps the instructor's morale when you can see those with whom you are in conversation. And of course, teaching is not merely a one-way avenue, it is uh, certainly a two-way uh, street. And so I, can, I appreciate when I can see uh, my students and of course, audience as well. I've entitled my brief lecture, 1919, the year of the revolutionary Black Messiah. And you're probably thinking what a peculiar title for a lecture at McGill University. I will shed light on the aftermath of the immediate post-war years and Black people's yearning for revolutionary change throughout the African world. And when you hear me use that nomenclature, African world, I'm referring to Black folk on the African continent, uh, in Latin America, North America, South America, you name it, wherever Black people uh, lived and resided, I refer to that as the African world. In my current and second book project, I argue that Jamaican Marcus Mosiah Garvey, founder of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, was the revolutionary Black Messiah. Where Black history is concerned, one of the most perceptive, profoundest philosophers and prophets of the Atlantic world lamented, and I'm borrowing his words, half that story has never been told. So now you see the light, stand up for your rights. And these are the words of the great Robert Nesta Marley, also known as Bob Marley. When it comes to the history of African peoples, specifically the months and years following the Great War, indeed, half that story has never been told. The Great War remapped the world. This remapping impacted Europe. It impacted what we refer to as the Middle East. It impacted Africa. It impacted North America and the entire Americas for that matter. The historian Margaret Macmillan, her groundbreaking book, Paris 1919, Six Months That Changed the World, painstakingly detailed the political intrigue, the maneuverings, the side deals, and of course, the ways that Western power, white power, would exploit African peoples and African lands. W.E.B. Du Bois, the great African-American intellectual and truly one of the greatest intellectuals of the Atlantic world in the past half millennium, attended the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. Du Bois, much like other African-American intellectuals and Black activists in general of his day considered 1919 as the breakthrough year for Black people the world over, living under colonialism or quasi-colonialism. In Paris, he spearheaded the inaugural Pan-African Congress to lobby the Western powers to facilitate decolonization. Du Bois, who was one of the founders of the NAACP, and in fact, sort of the key individual that lent the NAACP its intellectual heft, could not have accomplished this feat of organizing the, the first Pan-African Congress alongside the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 without the backing from the British Columbia-born Ida Gibbs Hunt his brilliant anti-imperialist co-organizer. 
And Gibbs Hunt, Ida Gibbs Hunt, uh, she was multilingual. Of course, she'd been born in territory that would be incorporated into the Canadian Dominion. Um, she was born of African-American parentage. Uh, but the historical record is, is very replete when we scrutinize the different actors in what is North America and including the Caribbean basin. Um, that we have Black folk who are sort of Canadian born or US born, Caribbean born, and these linkages that they forge in terms of imagining a better world um, is quite phenomenal. Um, and in, in fact, uh, for those who are Canadian and prefer sort of the Canadian narrative, um, this is just another really intriguing way in terms of how uh, those with meaningful connections to this country, uh, Black folk in particular, have shaped not just sort of parochial race politics, but global uh, politics in general. The proceedings in Paris 1919 failed to bear fruit. European colonialism of Africa and African peoples and global white supremacy continued. In fact, upon returning to the United States in the summer and autumn of 1919, discharged African-American soldiers experienced racial hostility, and in many cases, outright brutality, by which I mean lynchings, racial terrorism, anti-Black racial terrorism. African-American soldiers served valiantly on the Western Front. Now, imagine a situation where you have overwhelmingly Black men returning to the United States with stripes, with bars, with commendation, comported in their military regalia, and having white mobs unleash unimaginable terror upon them because Black people are not supposed to be distinguished. And to have military regalia that signals one's heroism and courage under fire implies that indeed Black people are human beings and moreover the Black men who served in this great war were men. But nonetheless, they return home. And Du Bois would refer to this as we return fighting. We went to fight for democracy, in quotations. We return fighting for our lives, for democracy is not in the sight lines of African Americans and Black people in general. And so valiantly did African Americans fight on the Western Front against the German war machine, that German soldiers in Germany and parts of France dubbed black battalions, black devils. And for the African-Americans, they embraced this nomenclature as a badge of honor. That this ferocious, militarized sort of imperial presence in continental Europe, that their fierce soldiers would refer to black men as black devils was easily the greatest honor for many of these men. And certainly a rebuke of all the forms of anti-blackness and anti-black racism that implied that black people were less than human, ironically. Nineteen nineteen was a phenomenal year, apocalyptic year. White supremacists throughout the country instigated nearly sixty, nearly sixty deadly interracial clashes. Jamaican-born Harlem resident Claude McKay wrote a poem in nineteen nineteen, and he entitled it "If." we must die. And this poem literally captured the fight stance of the new Negro 
and the dire conditions that inspired dogged resistance to white mob violence. One African-American whose eyewitness testimony I came across in the, in the Negro press, in the African-American press um, in 1920, but in reference to events that happened in 1919, this eyewitness, this black eyewitness, saw marauding white moms literally steps away from the White House, from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, steps away from the Congress with all types of weapons to unleash anti-Black terror upon Black civilians. But before this anti-Black terror could ensue, Black civilians tired of the one-sided onslaught, summoned, and I'm going to borrow this eyewitness's words because the prose is just out of this world, okay? The Black civilians steps from the White House and Congress whom the white terrorists sought to make their prey these civilians summoned up a fighting spirit buoyed up by deep religious fanaticism in pursuit of racial martyrdom. Past injustices came before the Negro like ghosts in a dream. And he swore by the best blood of his heart and by the eternal gods they shall not pass. The would-be lynchers awoke the sleeping demon of race consciousness as the Negro sensed the flavor of the glory of hate and dropped the sting of death to the white man's cup of arrogance." End quote. This dramatic prose served multiple purposes, but it certainly underscored the need to fight back. The need as this eyewitness and others would attest the importance of eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, life for life, death for death and damnation for damnation. Amidst widespread urban pogroms, and I use this word very carefully because that is the, that is the, the nomenclature that black journalists in 1919, 1920 and its aftermath, they specifically used the noun pogroms to describe the forms of ethnic cleansing and the genocidal logic of white power in the United States. Keep in mind that this is the era of anti-Black racial terrorism. The historian Rayford Logan referred to the period at the end of US Reconstruction, so 1877 to the turn of the century, the early 1900s, Logan referred to this period as the nadir. And nadir is Arabic for sort of the low point or the lowest of points, the valley. During these bloody clashes throughout the country, Garvey, Marcus Garvey, had been outspoken in his speeches and editorials, extolling the virtues of not turning the other cheek. Garvey was the quintessential new Negro. In other words, he believed that only uncompromising courage and armed self-defense would deter white terrorism. Before the apocalyptic moment or moments in 1919, Garvey had been quietly laying the foundation 
for a Black liberation movement since his arrival in New York City in March 1916. He originally left Jamaica intending to visit the Wizard of Skege, Booker T. Washington in Alabama. But Booker T. Washington transitioned to the hereafter, to the afterlife in November 1915, so about four months before Garvey would step foot on US soil. So Garvey could not meet this distant mentor who was larger than life, who was so brilliant in mobilizing and marshalling resources to advance the cause of Black empowerment and Black liberation. So Garvey had to adjust his plans. Instead of returning to Jamaica, he decided to tour the country. Right? This is again, 1916, it's the Great War. So there's much afoot. So Garvey is touring the United States. He's visiting different parts of the Deep South. He's meeting with sharecroppers, the most disinherited, disenfranchised, disempowered, dehumanized group in all of the lands. And Garvey's speaking with them and learning about their yearnings He's meeting with preacher men and preacher women. He's meeting with members of the black professional class, the middle class. And within months of his sojourn in the United States, Garvey sees the handwriting on the wall. He sees without equivocation what the challenges are and how to lead Black folk out of this quagmire, this intractable, what appeared like an intractable situation. The following year in 1917, he had established the US chapter of the UNIA in Harlem. And Harlem, of course, is the Mecca. It is the meeting ground, it is the heart of the black world, of the African world, okay. And in 1917, Garvey, having a very North American global vision of what liberation ought to look like, received an invitation incidentally from a Montreal resident by the name of Egerton Langdon, originally from Grenada, and Egerton Langdon, who in 1916, by happenstance, had heard Garvey delivering a soapbox lecture in Harlem, thought, my goodness, this individual is so eloquent and he is spot on about what our race as Black people need to do to overcome racial tyranny. And so, Egerton Langdon returns to Montreal and he sends an invitation to Marcus Mosiah Garvey and Garvey accepts. So in the winter of 1917, Garvey takes the train and comes to Montreal where he electrifies the community here, propagating his philosophy, his gospel, his doctrine of race first, self-determination predicated on African ancestry and the experiences of Black peoples. And incidentally, Egerton Langdon's niece, who recently arrived, had recently arrived from Grenada, also heard Garvey deliver his speech. And the great Louise Langdon, the niece of Egerton, by happenstance at, one of, at a Garvey event the following year, 1918, meets a handsome, well-spoken African-American man from Georgia. His name is Earl. His surname we don't really know, but his enslaver's surname was Little. 
So Earl Little meets Louise Langdon, and in 1919, they get married right here and then move to the United States. They would go on to have seven children, one of whom they named Malcolm. Malcolm didn't like his enslaver last name, so he changed it to X. By this time, Garvey had founded Negro World, which within months had become the most important periodical in the Black world, propagating the doctrine of race first and Black empowerment, Black self-determination and resistance, fierce resistance to European domination or any form of domination of Black people. And of course, Garvey is attracting a whole bunch of attention from the US government and US intelligence, British naval intelligence, Portuguese naval intelligence, French naval intelligence, Spanish naval intelligence, you name it. Because his word, his newspapers, black sailors are spreading the message around wherever they go, from South Africa to Kenya, to parts of West Africa, throughout Latin America, you name it. And so the Bureau of Investigation, which would become the Federal Bureau of Investigation, had recently appointed an up and coming law school graduate from George Washington University. His name is J. Edgar Hoover. And the US government assigned Hoover to shadow this electrifying black man this Jamaican immigrant. And in Hoover's surveillance, he observed that Garvey was an exceptionally astute organizer and an exceptionally fine orator. He had the gift for gab, a brilliant orator. I'm going to speed things up a little bit here in the interest of time. And in the Q&A, you're, you're more than welcome uh, to ask me uh, questions, certainly about the lecture and about the theme. So given the attention that Garvey was receiving for his remarkable organizing, an assailant, somebody who actually knew Garvey, walked into Garvey's, the UNIA's headquarters office in Harlem in October, around October 1919. And this gentleman took out a revolver. Upon seeing Garvey, started firing. Several missed Garvey. One struck him in his right leg. Another grazed his forehead two millimeters the other way, Marcus Garvey would simply be a footnote. Although shot, although wounded, Garvey ran after the assailant and his secretary who would become his wife, Amy Ashwood, also pursued the assailant. The police apprehended him he was housed at a, a county jail in on Manhattan and mysteriously died shortly thereafter. And members of the Garvey movement and hist some historians as well believe that this was an official assassination. It was a hit on Garvey's life. Likely came from the top. Garvey's race program created much concern, not just for the United States, but also 
the Canadian Dominion government, the British, as I noted, the French, the Dutch, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the entire Western alliance feared Garvey's race program because it would alter the balance of power. And Garvey, for the first time, had figured out a model for Black people to rejoice in their African identity, in their Blackness, that no longer would the masses look upon their ebony hue, their woolly hair, their broad nose, their full lips, as somehow a badge of bondage, but a, a badge of glory, of honor that they were made in their creator's image. And as innocuous as this message might seem, it was absolutely revolutionary. And Garvey even propagated an economic system, which several historians, in fact, and Garvey critics have described as black capitalism, but it couldn't be further from the truth. The UNIA under Garvey's leadership had launched a, a shipping line, which they called the Black Star Line. Factories, grocery stores, and of course, Negro World, the newspaper, the publishing house. And the model of these different economic enterprises was predicated on the idea that Black people only Black people should own the means of production where Black enterprise was concerned. This is not capitalism. Given Garvey's effective mobilization and his effective race program and economic program, Garvey was fighting on multiple fronts. The socialists warred with him. The communists warred with him. Black reactionaries warred with him. The NAACP and elite Black folk warred with him. And of course, the entire Western apparatus, the might of the known world collectively had mobilized to infiltrate his movement to subvert his effectiveness. I'll wrap up now, a few minutes here. The sheer destruction wrought by the Great War persuaded Black people that, indeed, white people could usher an apocalyptic turn in global affairs. Black communities felt a sense of urgency to act and resist further exploitation. Revolution was in the air, and the Negroes are ready for revolution, wrote C.L.R. James, the pioneering Trinidadian historian of the Haitian Revolution. Historian John Henry Clark noted that the American antecedents held the key to unlocking the Garvey phenomenon. Roy Otley, a journalist, called Garvey Harlem's first messiah, noting that Garvey leapt into the ocean of Black unhappiness at a most timely moment for a savior. St. Clair Drake, a pioneering social scientist, Black social scientist, pointed out that Garvey arrived in the United States in the fullness of time. And with nearly 60 violent clashes in 1919 and post-war disillusionment, African-Americans showed their readiness for racial salvation. In fact, during the First World War, Black clergy remained abreast of what they called the signs of the times, which in fact is a biblical reference to the coming of the Messiah. That Garveyism had apocalyptic overtones 
observed Drake, meant that Garvey himself exuded a messianism that complemented the African-American religious tradition. So this is one of the first biographies and historical accounts of the Garvey movement written by Bill Cronin. And as you can see the title, Black Moses, in reference to Garvey and his leadership, this seminal work Nonetheless, the seminal work had the effect of portraying Garvey as a buffoon, a Negro buffoon who presided over these elaborate parades and colorful military regalia. And of course, the title, Black Moses, right? And the astute student of history should ask Cronin, Professor Cronin, why qualify Moses with an adjective? If Moses indeed was a historical actor, a liberator and emancipator, why qualify Moses? What we know about Moses is that Moses was born in the Valley of the Nile. He was born in the heartland of African civilizations, of Nilotic Black African civilizations. Moses came of age in the house of Pharaoh. Moses married, according to biblical texts, married a woman who was ethnically a Kushite, meaning her peoples were as ebony as the hair on my head and my face. Why qualify Moses? If only one intended as a historian, as an intellectual, as a scholar, to dismiss this Black Moses as just a buffoon. And this narrative, starting in when the book was first published in 57 and uh, reprinted several times thereafter, this narrative persisted that Garvey was just a buffoon who led a cultish movement at best. And that was furthest from the truth. And revelation of copious primary sources in the wake of Garvey's death in the 1970s in Harlem illustrated the extent of his movement. That Garvey indeed was a shepherd with millions in his flock, millions when in fact the boys and other elite black folks and other white observers thought Garvey only had a few hundred thousand followers at best. And Garvey said he, his followers were in the millions, turned out over 6 million, the greatest mass movement ever in the African world. Garvey would go on to solidify his stature as indeed a revolutionary Black Messiah. In 1920, at the inaugural UNIA Inter International Convention, which took place in Harlem and also Madison Square Garden, Garvey was elected the President General of the UNIA and Provisional President of Africa. He was easily one of the most powerful individuals in the world who led truly a mass movement, movement of the peoples, the salt of the earth people. The entire Western apparatus, including the Dominion of Canada, mobilized to surveil, infiltrate, and subvert Garvey's movement. He made no bones about the UNIA's plan to, re to create a USA, United States of Africa. And Garvey understood 
that this could only happen by the edge of the sword and at the point of the bayonet and by the muzzle of the rifle. For the Europeans who had laid siege on the known world would not retreat one inch from that which they had requisitioned from the colored peoples of the world. Jamaican Marcus Mosiah Garvey was indeed the original, the blueprint, the archetype of revolutionary messianic leadership among black people. The preoccupation of US intelligence services to eliminate, and I quote, Negro messiahs during the COINTELPRO counterintelligence program of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, which resulted in assassinations of countless Black leaders, Medgar Evers, Malcolm, Martin, Hampton, and scores of other Black males who impacted or who displayed uncompromising courage and commitment to Black liberation. Garvey's leadership, his ethical leadership, his hard-nosed leadership, his love for Black people has shaped and continues to shape Western policy where the African world is concerned. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll give a round of Zoom applause, however you would choose to do it. Thank you so much, Professor JJ. We do have some questions from the crowd, so I'll throw a couple crowd questions at you. If Natalie and Chris, you have any, you can voice your own, but I'll start with some from the crowd. Um, so one of the first actually is a follow-up question on the Canadian, um, one Canadian you mentioned, Ida Gibbs Hunt, I believe her name was. A question came in to, to say a little bit more um, about her and her role and the Canadian role in this. And that ties in with the second question from the crowd, um, asking specifically about solidarity or unsolidarity um, in between Black resistance in 1919 in the States and in Canada, if there was any. So looking again at that cross-border relationship and Canadian content. Sure, uh, my pleasure. So Ida Gibbs Hunt, um, as I noted, was born of African-American parentage in uh, British Columbia. And she grew up very much having a, not a sort of a nationalist orientation, but a, a very diasporic African understanding of who she was, given her con connections to Canada, um, to the United States. Uh, she married a diplomat and given his travels and their travels and um, her uh, multilingual um, capabilities and the ways that she would support um, her husband um, and his work uh, was very much uh, influential in terms of uh, the 1910s and 1920s. In fact, she is easily the most influential Pan-Africanist woman of that particular era. And much of the work that Du Bois, W.E.B. Du Bois, sort of one of the fathers of Pan-Africanism the work that Du Bois would do relied on uh, Ida Gibbs's, uh, her acumen, her, her brilliant organizing, her staunch anti-imperialism, um, her truth telling, and these connections um, to uh, Canadian society and Black activists was very much present um, in the era of 1919 and 1920. And so what happens is that the Black men who fight from, from this very city, right? Uh, from Montreal who go overseas and fight in the Great War and return in Toronto and Halifax and elsewhere, upon returning similarly like their African-American counterparts, um, although they didn't endure the same type of racial terrorism at home, um, they experienced the sting of rejection and um, uh, disrespect right, and in gratitude for their, their services. And they would often say, our sons have shouldered arms for this empire and we haven't received our due. We do not have adequate housing. And this was a moment when, of course, Garvey's message was gaining traction. Garvey's saying that no one is coming to save us. Regardless of how much blood we shed for them, they won't save us. And that what we must do 
is organized because the greatest weapon that our adversaries deployed against us was to disorganize us. And so Garvey said, we must organize and we must organize based on our blackness, race first, on our African heritage and ancestry and our struggles um, via the uh, middle passage, this genocidal uh, flesh trade that um, has occurred. And so um, the NAACP opened up uh, chapters in Canada and, you know, African Canadians uh, embraced it with enthusiasm, but they would, in essence, engage Garvey's uh, UNIA more because that was revolutionary. It was a different paradigm. No one had seen anything like it um, previously. Um, and so uh, the Bois' message, and although the Bois was hardly highly regarded in Canada, um, Black folk in Canada embraced Garveyism in the UNIA. So here in Montreal and I mean across the country, Toronto, out east, and the Maritimes as well. Hmm. It's interesting the the language that you use, Black Messiah. Was this something which he was referred to at the time, or is this language that has since been imposed on his movement by historians or scholars or people within the movement themselves? So Garvey's followers, and this is what makes Garvey such a unique. Leader. Um, as I noted, he was exceptionally ethical. And that most leaders, Garvey observed when he came to the United States, that most of the quote unquote Negro leaders only exploited the wretched Black folk, only exploited them so that they could maintain their proximity to white power. And Garvey said, This is not who we are as African peoples. And so Garvey literally um, envisioned a form of leadership that would be from the ground up. And so without equivocation, his followers referred to him as Moses. They didn't qualify it. They referred to him as their Moses, right? Their deliverer, their emancipator. And there have been other sort of messianic types of um, messianic black leaders like um, Harriet Tubman, whom other African-Americans also refer to as Moses, right? And so this of course transcended gender. It wasn't about a man thing or, or anything of that nature. Um, but Garvey's followers certainly refer to him as, as, a, as a messiah. Um, but Black elites um, and the likes of Du Bois, and of course, later on, Du Bois would change tune and start parroting Garvey's rhetoric and realize that Garvey actually did something significant for the race, right? Um, and so Black elites and sort of, you know, white people and the U.S. government uh, actually, Black elites, white people um, dismiss Garvey as this buffoon, this jackass, this gorilla looking uh, Negro with intelligent eyes, all these racist sort of anti-Black tropes. The only entity in the country that literally took Garvey's messianic acumen for what it was, was the U.S. federal government. Uh -huh. So the response of being surveilled was an acknowledgement of his importance by the US government. Yes, there is an enormous number of thanks and raised hands and applause in the chat. We have reached 1 p.m. So that's our normal wrap up. I'll have a couple of thank yous. And then if you do have time to stay on, there's a couple more questions um, and we can, we can go a little bit over. But I will say an enormous thank you officially for 1 p.m. Thank you for a great lecture, for an eye-opening one. Um, and thank you too to the other people who made this happen, the Chris, the Natalie, Labiba, and our sponsors, of course. Thank you all of you for coming. I encourage you to look on the McGill website for other events for Black History Month. And of course, you can tune in to our coming events. Um, our next is on February 23rd. Um, that one will be by artist Amy Sua Wo on steganography, the art of hiding messages in plain sight, which for a lot of people throughout history, <laughs> that has been an important skill um, for people who are marginalized everywhere. So thank you once again for an extraordinary presentation. I invite those of you who want to stay, if we have a few more minutes of your time, Professor JJ will stay with a couple more questions. So one, uh, immediately I'll address it, it is recorded. We are gonna circulate the link after the, uh, after the event. So we'll be sending that out tomorrow. So thank you everyone and goodbye to those of you who need to turn tune out. Um, I'm not sure Natalie or Chris, if you had any questions, we have a couple more from the crowd. Okay. I think I, Iwa and um, Devon and Matthias have been waiting for a long time, very patiently. Yes, 
And thank you, Arwa, for putting your question in the chat here. Um, because of the number of people, I will be voicing them on everyone's behalf. So thank you for writing that out. Um, the question is from Iwa, I was hoping you could speak more to Garvey's Jamaican Caribbean background and how that shaped his message and activism. And do you see the background playing out in the tension between Garvey and Dubois, for instance? So thank you, Iwa, for patience and for putting your question in the chat today. Yes, that's an excellent question. Um, Garvey's background, his Jamaican background uh, was uh, instrumental in terms of his organizing and his ability to discern the race question upon arrival in the United States. So Garvey having been born in, in Jamaica in 18, August 1887, um, having been apprenticed as a, a printer and then traveling you know, throughout the Caribbean and, and Latin America um, and meeting black people, Jamaican expats and just other black people in the region. Um, and he always discerned one thing, Race stratification ensured that Black people were always subordinated and subjugated. He went to the Metropole, i.e. London, and discerned the same thing when he met African travelers. They would always say the same thing, that we are subordinated, we are you know, terrorized, um, we've been dispossessed of our Indigenous lands. Um, and so upon arrival in the United States, um, and given sort of his very acute understanding of uh, of the sort of color tocracy or, or stratification system in, in Jamaica, um, Garvey could make sense of what even Du Bois couldn't fully comprehend. And Du Bois, he was our first PhD from Harvard. Du Bois is this giant of a thinker, right? But Du Bois didn't fully grasp the souls of Black folk. And he actually authored a book entitled The Souls of Black Folk. But the boys didn't really understand sort of the nature of the salt of, of the earth type of people because he hadn't grown up um, among them. Um, and so, like there was another question in the chat about the middle class, which I think you're, you're touching on this a little bit here in that you, you spoke largely about sort of the elite, um, but what you refer to as the salt of the earth, is that another way of speaking of the middle class or is that a sort of missing strata in this conversation? By salt of the earth, I'm referring to the um, sharecropper class in general. So the, the, the black proletariat class. Okay. I cut you off, but. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, but yeah, just to wrap up that segment. Um, so Garvey's experience growing up in a majority sort of black context, um, having a very strong pride in self and Garvey was ebony black, right? And so proud, just ferociously proud of who he was as an African in Jamaica, and then in the United States. Uh, and, you know, having been well traveled, well read, he was able to literally piece everything together in ways that his US counterparts couldn't. Um, and so upon his arrival, and once he started meeting with sharecroppers and different people in the United States, different black people, they realized that this guy's the real deal and that his race program was very audacious, but Garvey was not, he had no intentions to retreat um, and hence why he was able to mobilize uh, um, you know, over 6 million people. And in fact, the heart of the UNI was African-Americans, right? It, was, it wasn't even Jamaica, it was, a, it was the African-American uh, population. So a follow-up question about um, the more economic model that Garvey and the UNIA uh, voted and developed. Um, you're speaking a little bit there about, about the more, the race program that he had. Um, the economic model, someone wants to know more about it. How was it different from black capitalism and socialism, communism? Um, so could you say a little bit more about that economic model? I also made notes about it. I was like, oh, I need to, I need to figure this out a little bit deeper. So maybe a little bit more elaboration on that point. Sure. So Garvey, at the time, um, socialists, and remember, this is sort of in the wake of the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917, right? And so socialists had um, strong standing, communists had strong standing, um, you know, they had black people as members of their ranks. And there were black liberals, of course, like the boys, um, and sort of well to do black people, um, and different organizations vying for the membership of the black masses. And Garvey introduces a paradigm whereby 
it wouldn't just be the same sort of you know hackneyed forms of um of capitalism and, and sort of exploitation of land labor and capital but garvey introduced a model whereby it was actually very much a socialist enterprise and so um uh, the U and I launched the uh, Black Star shipping line, and in fact, regular sharecroppers, and I'm talking people in the Mississippi Delta, the Carolinas, uh, you know, Detroit, et cetera, et cetera, would literally purchase stock for five dollars to own this shipping line. It was just poor black people, regular black folk, and so Garvey realized that. It shouldn't just be a few black individuals who are often very, you know, light complexioned, um, who have, you know, a, a privileged ed formal education, who should benefit from uh, the economy, but that the economy should be owned and the enterprises should be owned by the masses. And so this model of having black folk, poor black folk own stock in black companies, whether those the Black Star shipping line, the Negro factories, um, uh, grocery stores um, made this enterprise very much sort of anti-capitalist, in fact, in a very sort of radical sense. But because Garvey hasn't really received his full due, and you know, one of the greatest historians to write on Garvey was um, Tony Martin. His book, Race First in 1976, really sort of changed the landscape in terms of how we understand Garvey and his movement. Um, but most historians often dismiss Garvey as being this buffoon and, you know, this sort of gaudy leader um, without understanding that what Garvey was introducing was very much um, akin to what the socialists were advocating. But the socialists despised them because Garvey said, we will do this and we will make race first. We will not disavow race because race is singularly the most important variable in the known world. So there's no sense of pretending as if its effects don't exist. So I there's one more. Well, there's a couple more questions, but one I think I'll, I'll pose to you, but it's it's not a short. Sure. It's the launch of a whole discussion. So I encourage everyone who's still here, you can continue the conversation. Reach out by email to us and to Professor JJ if you want to continue exploring this topic. Like Chris said at the beginning, you can email rare books and come in and look at any of the materials that support research in this area, the Roy State's collection that he mentioned. Um, this last one is, is launching a whole question. Um, so thank you, Matthias, for waiting very patiently with your hand up and his question is here. Um, could you speak to the claims that Garvey was a black colonizer? And I use quotes there. In terms of his back to Africa movement and comments about Africa as quote, backward and pagan, unquote. How do you describe the imagination of Africa by Garvey, especially given the historical fact of Black resettlement in Sierra Leone and Liberia and the conflicts that ensued? So there's a big question. Thank you, Matthias. And maybe you yes. guys have a dialogue. <laughs> big, big and excellent question. And, and um, you said uh, Matthias asked that. So please uh, feel free to, to reach out to me as well, Matthias, and we can we can continue the dialogue. So uh, some have critiqued Garvey of being sort of an imperialist, a, a colonizer. And to a small extent, I can sort of appreciate why those critiques would arise. Um, but we have to go beyond sort of the, the surface level rhetoric, right? We have to engage what Garvey's race program entailed. And when Garvey spoke of USA, United States of Africa, this was easily the most subversive and revolutionary idea of the 20th century. And Garvey's whole premise where Africa was concerned was that Africans needed to govern their own affairs, that Africans must have integrity of their own borders, not ones drawn up in Europe, um, that Africans must have access to their own natural resources to build their own African empire, an African empire with an African army, with an African navy, with an African medical corps. And when I say African, I'm referring to black peoples, right? From, from wherever they might be located in the known world. And this particular paradigm gave great 
pause to not only some Black leaders, um, but certainly Garvey's uh, Western adversaries. And so given the extent to which uh, Garvey committed to the movement, his, his love for Black people, um, his desire that African spirituality should govern um, sort of forms of African religion, uh, that Black people should stop uh, genuflecting to altars of white deities, but that they should imagine their creator and to teach their children, inculcate them with the value that the, that spiritual force that created them also looks like them. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that this notion of, of paganism, um, if Garvey's critiquing paganism, Garvey's critiquing African spirituality that does not center issues of race. And as I've noted, the, the, the effectiveness of disorganization against the Negro, uh, meaning turning Black people against themselves, their corporeal selves, um, and making little Black children aspire to whiteness in a sense. Um, this is inherently paganistic because it doesn't serve the, the liberation interests of Black people. And so Garvey introduced a paradigm um, that would make race first in everything, in economics, in politics, in sort of military organization. And the UNI had assembled its own militia, literally, because they knew if we want to take back that which is ours in our ancestral indigenous lands, it will require bloodshed because the Europeans will not relinquish it. And it is Garvey's principles, it is Garvey's ideas that would animate a generation of Black freedom fighters. Remember, most of these mostly young men who came to the United States to study from Azikwe to Nkrumah, et cetera, et cetera, they would go back to Africa to what would become Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, um, animated by Garvey's ideas in terms of Black liberation and Pan-Africanism, a united Africa. And so Nkrumah would even start working towards um, the creation of the United States of Africa, okay, and putting Blackness at the top of all forms of organization. Well, thank you again for staying over as well, um, and we'll wrap up there. That, as I said, I encourage everyone with continuing questions who wants to continue the dialogue to reach out, and we will send a follow-up with links and resources tomorrow. So thanks again, everyone, an enormous thank you to Professor JJ, and have a great afternoon.